Good evening, everybody, those of you who are in India. Uh, good morning to Thomas, uh, who is in New York. And um, good afternoon and good night to those of you who may be in other parts of the world. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar series hosted by the Mahindra University School of Management. Uh, we are calling the series Cutting Edge Charcha. Now you may be wondering, those of you who don't speak Hindi, you may be wondering what is charcha? A charcha in Hindi simply means discussion, you know? And uh, we've initiated the series to discuss about some cutting edge topics in management. So this is cutting edge charcha on management. And it's my great pleasure that the first uh, speaker in the series is Thomas Weddell Weddellsburg, uh, who happens to be uh, my student. Uh, so he studied at ESA Business School. He did his MBA from ESA Business School when I was a faculty member there. And um, I would just like to briefly share his bio. Uh, by the way, the title of the session is uh, Solving the Right Problem, the Art of Reframing. And uh, Thomas has done uh, quite a bit of work in this area over the past many years. And I just wanted to share with you his background. So his background is that he is a globally recognized expert on innovation and problem solving. He has another book uh, published by uh, the Harvard Business uh, Press uh, on innovation. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, so his book uh, titled, What's Your Problem? that was published in 2020 was recommended by former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt, uh, with the words, if you want the superpower of solving better problems, read this book. His first book, Innovation as Usual, was co-authored with uh, Professor Paddy Miller, the late Professor Paddy Miller, uh, who passed away, unfortunately, in 2018. And uh, Professor Paddy Miller had a huge impact on the lives of both Thomas and myself. Uh, so this book was published in 2013, and it focuses on how to make innovation happen in large organizations. He also has two influential Harvard Business Review articles. Uh, he has been featured in The Economist, Forbes, Bloomberg, Business Week, and uh, The Financial Times. Uh, the HR magazine uh, ranked him as a top 20 international thinker and Thinkers 50 uh, placed him on the 2021 radar as someone who is rising as uh, a great thinker in the areas of management. Uh, Thomas is Danish. Uh, before I forget, Thomas, my commiserations to you for uh, uh, yes. Denmark's loss against uh, England in the Euro Cup. Very, um, very tragic. A, a, yeah. a very bad judgment from the yes. from the judges of that match, I would say. Yeah, from the from the referees. Yes, I hope you have recovered from that from that shock. Um, and Thomas is um, a graduate of ESA Business School, as I mentioned before. Uh, he studied there while I was at the faculty, and it was my pleasure to have him in class. Uh, he's I still remember Thomas very vividly. Um, he's one of these students that every teacher wants to have a few of. Uh, in every class because they radiate positivity. Their positivity is infectious, okay? And um, uh, that's why I remember Thomas so well. And I have followed his uh, career since he graduated. Uh, was it 2006, uh, Thomas? Yes, and uh, I, I would say uh, uh, you want a few of me, but maybe not too many <laughs> because <laughs> that's, that's possible. But yes, I, uh, I have very fond memories of, uh, of, of uh, both our shared colleague, Paddy, but of course also your sessions. And they were actually in part, uh, my, my work subsequently grew in part out of the, the, the lessons you taught. Oh, thank uh, you so, so much. So I'm very, I'm very glad to be capable of, of joining here, showing a little bit later in the yeah. process. Sure, sure. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for your kind words. Yeah. And prior to his current career uh, as a speaker and a corporate trainer and advisor to companies, and of course, an author, um, uh, Thomas served uh, in the Danish Royal Guards. 
So um, without further ado, let me uh, uh, start off the session by um, uh, asking Thomas, you know, uh, my first question, which is, you know, you conducted a survey of managers of large corporations in many different countries uh, on the specific topic of uh, problem solving. And uh, the findings of the survey were quite surprising. So could you share them briefly, Thomas? The findings uh, was effectively that we tend to solve the wrong problems. I went out and asked 106 uh, CEOs and other uh, people at the top of the organization. And what they told me was, when you consider how we solve problems, we are fairly good at solving problems once we understand it. But what we're bad at is making sure we are solving the right problem. And actually, 85% of the companies or the CEOs that I interviewed, they told me that their companies both were not good at solving the right problems and that they spent a lot of time and money because of that. That, mm -hmm. that we just have this habit of looking at the wrong problem to start with. And then we put time, energy, money, or so much effort into running down the wrong path, if you will, solving the wrong problem. Oh, that, oh. that was a surprising finding to me. Okay, okay. So that set you off on this uh, research into um, uh, problem solving and uh, you know the, the topic that you're gonna share with us, which is reframing. So talk to us about your central argument you know, from your research. I would say uh, the central argument builds on a ton of different research. So I have really further developed a method that has already been explored by Albert Einstein, by Peter Drucker, and later in, in, in the 60s, that's where we see the first evidence for the, what I call the power of reframing. The, uh, this gentleman, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, a Hungarian psychologist, and his mentor, Jacob Getzels, they go in and determine that people who are good at problem solving, people who are good at innovation, they tend to focus more on the problem than on the solution. And I like to, to share it in a specific way. Um, when you think of problem solving, we tend to think that it has two components. We say, well, we need to analyze the problem. And once we have analyzed it, then we can go and solve the problem. Now, that's great. But what the research has pointed out and what I, my method is, is teaching you how to work with is that there's a key component before that, which is called framing the problem. And this part is the part people are bad at. So we're great at analyzing problems, or sometimes we tend to jump very quickly into solution mode. What most of us need to learn is to make sure we are solving the right problem in the first place. So that, in a nutshell, is the, uh, the, the central argument that I'm making and, and talking about how to do it. Wonderful. So give us an example, Thomas. Ah, I, I have a very simple example that I love to use, and it is one that you can share as well with uh, whoever you work with. It, it's basically uh, reframing explained in 45 seconds. I'd like you to imagine that you are the owner of an office building and that people in the building, they are complaining about the elevator, that the elevator in the building is too slow. Now think about this problem. We are saying really here, well, the problem is, how is it framed that the elevator is too slow? And what do people do then? Well, they jump into solution mode and they say, how can we solve this problem? Well, we can make the elevator faster. And then they spend all of their time figuring out can we buy a new elevator? Can we put in a new motor? Is there something we can do to make the elevator faster? Now, if you ask an experienced landlord, 
they're going to suggest a very different solution to you. They're going to suggest, simply put, that you go into the hallway and put up a mirror next to the elevator. Because what happens is, of course, that people go, I'm busy, I'm busy. They arrive at the elevator, they see the mirror, they go, oh, oh, that's beautiful. And they forget time. That is a core example of what I'm talking about here, of solving a different problem than the one that's first put in front of you. Here, you see how it's originally framed as a slow elevator. What we're talking about here is what's called reframing, to go in and say it's actually not the speed, it is the weight that's the real problem we want to solve for. This move here is reframing. You go in, and instead of getting trapped in the first framing of the problem, it might be the way your client presents it to you or your colleagues. If you do that, you get trapped here. Instead of getting trapped in that, you go in and frame the problem and try to see, is there a different way of framing it? Maybe we could deal with the weight instead by putting up a mirror. That's the simplest example uh, that really captures what reframing is about. The difference between just solving it, analyzing why is the elevator slow, and then asking, is there another way of framing this problem? Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's probably the simplest example, the most memorable example I know, the slow elevator problem. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, there are other ways to frame the same problem, I suppose, because I've read that in your book. Uh, what are a couple of other ways in which you could frame this problem? Right? Well, that's interesting, right? You can see this is just one example, and this might not work if mm -hmm. they're late for something important, then a mirror is just going to be a distraction. Another way of framing the problem, for instance, could be to say, well, it's around the timing that people arrive at, uh, it's, it's at 12 o'clock it happens, because that's where everybody goes to lunch. And so maybe we could actually go in, if that's another way of looking at it, we could go in and shift the lunch breaks. So people on different floors have uh, arrived for lunch at a slightly different time. That's another example of it. And it really highlights a key idea that there's never just one way of framing the problem. You're not necessarily looking for the only and right answer or the root cause. You're looking for potential other ways of looking at it. Problems are multi-causal. There's many different causes for them. And that means there's typically many different ways of trying to solve them. Mm. Another one could be that the tenants are not aware where the stairs are. So perhaps those who are renting the lower fro floors would use the stairs if they knew where they were, right? That could be another reason that, that they are frustrated. Exactly. Really good reframing as well. Where mm -hmm. What's happening with the stairs? Why are people not using those? Yeah. So you, you can see how even a simple example like this, once you think about it, there's typically actually many different ways of understanding what the problem is. And that's true for real world problems as well. As well, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I know that you've done uh, quite a bit of research on this with companies and you've actually gone out in the field and you've, you've got some really interesting examples in your book and in, in your articles. Why don't you share with us one, you know, an example that's perhaps not as simple as this one, uh, but it's also uh, uh, equally impactful. I want to share then a story um, that really showed me the huge difference it can make when you frame the problem correctly. And mm -hmm. it is about dogs. So uh, you, for those of you who have visited uh, America, you may know that there's a big problem with shelter dogs in America. So basically, uh, what when you look at it every single year, there's around 3 million dogs and other pets that end up in a shelter. And about half of those eventually get adopted, which means every single year, we need new 
extra new homes for more than a million dogs in the US. And often, sadly, many of these dogs end up uh, not being adopted uh, and having to be humanely euthanized uh, because we can't find new homes for them. Now, I want to share the story of a woman called Lori Weiss because she made a, a stunning realization recently based on a data point everybody knew already but hadn't understood. Lori is the uh, founder of a rescue group, which is an organization that helped try to help the dogs get adopted. And the data point she run in, ran into was this one, that 30% of all the dogs that are in a shelter are what's called owner surrenders. And owner surrender is when the family who owns the dog deliberately hands it over to the shelter. It hasn't run away or anything. It is literally the family coming and saying, here, take our dog and put it into the shelter. Now, if you think about people who work in this call it an industry, it's mostly volunteers. How do you think they feel about owner surrenders? Well, they really don't like them. They think if you're willing to, to hand over a dog, well, that's like handing over your own kid. Like you should never have had a dog in the first place. And so the entire industry looked at this data point and framed the problem as bad owners. There are just too many people out there that are not responsible, they can't handle having a dog, and so we need to make sure they don't adopt one. So the industry framing the problem around bad people, they go in and put barriers to adoption up. They go in and screen, like if you're trying to adopt a dog in the US, that's actually a difficult process because they're afraid you're a bad person. I will show you an example of this. Uh, this will be quite rapid fire. This is a sample form from a real adoption agency. Here are the questions you have to answer if you want to try to save a dog from dying. Why do you want a dog? Have you had a dog before? Have you had this type of dog before? Will the dog be home alone during the day? What's the name of your uh, wife or husband or roommate? What is the name of your employer? Can we get the name and phone number of your landlord? Can we get some personal references, a, a veterinary reference as well? Do you have a yacht that's fenced in? And the key question, have you ever brought a dog to a shelter before? The industry has just created barriers to their own goal because they see the problem as one of bad people. And this is where Laurie comes into the picture. Laurie had a sense that there was something wrong with this belief that 30% of all dog owners were bad. And so she went in and did a learning experiment. And you can see it here a little bit on the side. That's an image for it. What she did was she went in for one shelter in Los Angeles. And she had one person from her organization stand there at the entrance next to the poster you see. And whenever a family came in and said, we want to hand over our dog, well, they would ask, hey, if you could, would you like to keep it? And that was the first big insight. 75%, more than three in four families said yes to that. They did not want to get rid of their dog. They were not tired of it. They wanted to keep it. And so what did it turn out to be when they asked, so why do you feel you have to hand it over? What's the problem? It turned out that it was not about bad people. It was about money. The families who handed over dogs were typically quite poor. They were at a point where, you know, they may have had the dog for eight years. They loved the dog. They had to move into a new building. 
and the landlord comes in and says, you need to put down a $150 deposit in order to have a dog in the building. And this family, $150, that's just not money you can get. In, in, in the US, uh, more than 40% of all families struggle to find even $400 for an emergency. And of course, at the end base of that pyramid, it is much more significant. And so what Laurie found out was that there is a better way to solve the problem or a better problem to solve. Instead of trying to increase adoption from the shelters, she tried to help the dogs stay with their first family. They would go in and make a deposit give a check to the landlord and say, here is your $150 if anything happens. If not, we get it back. And it turned out that that approach not only helped the families keep their dog and keep the dogs out of the shelter system, it was also much more cost effective per dollar compared to the other ways they tried to help. So basically their cost per dog they helped went from $85 down to $60 with this new method. This, this example blew my mind because this is not about new technology. There was no new technology involved in this. It was literally just that there is an industry that for 20 years plus had thought about the problem in one way and ignored another part of the problem. And then a woman like Lori came in saw the problem differently, validated that, and ended up basically changing her industry without any new technology at all, just by reframing what the problem was actually about. So that, I've, I know it's a slightly longer story, but really it stood out to me so clearly because I think there are many of the problems we face that we could perhaps do better on if we got better at this from the personal problems to societal to problems in business and so on. So, so I'll, 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 I'll stop here, uh, Rama. Yeah, that's a great example, Thomas. And um, uh, thank you for that. So now, wonderful. So uh, reframing is, is uh, important and you've convinced us that it can open up um, new pathways uh, of solutions. Um, so what would you say would be the steps that managers can take in this process of reframing or in some ways redefining what the problem is? Exactly. Um, I'm going to put it to you in, in two ways because the very basic process is, is super simple. And I've, I've illustrated it here a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, if you think of reframing, you can really see it as a three-step habit that you go in, you first frame the problem. You literally say, wait, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Then you spend at least five minutes, could be longer, but at least five minutes trying to rethink the problem. Go in and did almost like what we did in the, in the elevator example, if you will, go in and say, is there another way of seeing the problem? Instead of going into solution mode, you spend a couple of minutes trying to rethink the nature of the problem. Ideally, get a couple of other people to help you with that. And then at the end, you have to move forward. Uh, and with that, I mean, the only danger of reframing is that you get stuck in thinking. Uh, eventually, at the end of the day, uh, you have to do something in order to, to make progress with the problem. And I added that because I think especially smart people can sometimes have a tendency to, to think a little too much and not actually do anything. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is the basic process. What's the problem? Could the problem be seen differently? How do we move forward? Mm -hmm. But what I have focused on in my work is to try to figure out how do you get better at this second step? Because that's where the challenge is. And so what I'm going to share with you now, and we can take them one by one, are five specific questioning strategies, if you will. Five specific types of questions that can help you surface a new angle on a problem or redefine the problem, if you will. Looking outside the frame, 
rethinking the goal, examining bright spots, looking in the mirror, and taking their perspective. Let's shall we delve into these uh, one at a time or what? what yeah, 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 yeah. Before you do that, I just wanted to um, just uh, make a comment on on uh, your number one there, which is frame. Uh, it's not always the case that you frame the problem. Very often, the problem is framed for you by somebody else, right? Yeah, and yes. and we sometimes unquestioningly tend to accept the problem as it's given to us. Um, yeah, so that's just just a comment that I wanted to make. Sorry. Yes. Absolutely. Like, very good point. It is it's actually relatively rare that a problem is completely undefined. Mm. Most typically, either your boss or your client has an opinion about what the problem is. They come to you and say, the problem is that the elevator is slow. Mm. And that's where it is critical for good leaders to actually take that step back and say, is there a different way of solving it? Instead of saying, sure, I can make the elevator faster for you. Because then we get trapped in, in yeah. their framing of the problem. Sure, sure, yeah. So, so uh, please go ahead with the, with the steps. Uh, yeah. yes. I, I feel the first one we have almost covered already, but it is this idea of looking outside the frame. I mentioned before this notion that we go in, we kind of, when the problem is put in front of us, we have a tendency just to delve deeper into that problem and ask, why is the elevator slow? What we're talking about here, of course, is to go in and say, when you have a frame, before you delve deeper into it, is there anything outside of it? Like, is there anything we are not looking at at the moment? For instance, uh, one of the management consultant companies that I interviewed for this, they had a famous case where one of their clients had a problem. They couldn't solve it, like that they had no idea what was going on and why they were seeing these dynamics in the market. And it turned out that they had been forgetting about a stakeholder. They were basically standing and looking at the problem and saying, well, there's the client in here, and then there's the client's client, like, you know, the, the people who, who uh, come to the client with their problem. What they had mit, missed was that there is a third stakeholder who had a huge impact on the, the, their, the client's client's behavior, meaning if they didn't understand that person's business model, they could never hope to fix the problem in here. So that's a classic example of just forgetting somebody like, oh, you know, these people here, they actually have a big impact on the problem, but we are only focused on what's going on on the other side of something. Mm -hmm. So basic notion, when you have framed a problem, look outside it before you delve deep into it. Good. Uh, let's do the, yeah, the re rethink the goal. Uh, mm -hmm. This, I have a, a beautiful story here. Um, I'll start with the story actually. There was a leader who hated his boss. He, he loved his job, but he hated his boss. And at the end of the day, he decided, okay, I have had enough. I'm going to go to a headhunter, uh, an executive search firm, and ask to, them to find me a new job in the same industry. He does that, and the headhunter tells him, well, that's great. Uh, there's a lot of demand for experienced leaders like you in the industry at the moment. So it will be very easy to find you a new job. Now, that same evening, the leader went back to his wife. And the wife was experienced in reframing. And together, they came up with a different solution or, uh, or better goal to pursue, namely, what happened was the next day, the leader went back to the headhunter and he said, here is the CV of my boss. Can you find a new job for my boss? <laughs> and, and, and this is a story from Robert Sternberg. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a story from Robert Sternberg. And according to Sternberg, what happened was uh, that the boss ended up accepting that new job without having any idea of what was happening. And the leader ended up getting his boss's old job. So what is that an example of? 
of thinking about what success looks like. We tend just to say, okay, winning looks like this. Success looks like this, that I move into a new company uh, without my boss. But sometimes you can actually rethink, are there other ways of winning? And in this case, well, that the boss got a new job. So making sure when you're looking at a problem you're facing, what is the goal? And is there a different way of thinking about what that goal, like how can you rethink that? Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent, yes, yeah. wonderful. Bright yeah. spots. Yeah. Um, bright spots is uh, in part from this study that's called like root cause analysis. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, powerful method that has a long history too. And bright spots is about the fact that we tend to focus on the negative. When we have a problem, we look at all the occasions when the problem occurs and try to think about it. But very often, you actually can find new insights or new ways forward by asking, where are the bright spots? When was the problem not so bad? Did we ever solve the problem at one point? Example, um, a good friend of mine used to fight a lot with her husband. Uh, her name is Tanya, and they all, they had a good marriage, but they always got into these big arguments about the budget, about who walked the dog, and so on. In the beginning, they thought it was like for deep personal reasons, like their childhoods, uh, their, their different values, all of that, you know, the, the usual story about how it's your parents that really are to blame. <laughs> Except when Tanya started to look for bright spots, she noticed one point where they were talking about the budget, which was normally really sensitive, but it was super easy. And then she asked, wait, what was different about that day? And she realized it was because normally they had their discussions in the evening, but this discussion was over breakfast. Like, the fundamental problem was not just their values and their different childhoods. It was also that they had a habit of talking about hard things late in the evening when everybody's tired. And Tanya told me just by instigating this rule where you, if it's after 10 o'clock, you can't talk about something serious. Then you have to wait to the next morning. That removed 80% of their arguments. Like not everything, but eight, four out of five just disappeared from looking at the bright spots, trying to think about when is this problem less bad? When have we solved it, if even if once? Wonderful, wonderful example. Yeah, I think we can all use that in our in our own lives, right? And 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 uh, and uh, yeah, one of the most difficult relationships to manage, I think, is is the spousal relationship. And this is a very uh, good tip for that. Yes, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It's like your spouse is like your boss, but you can't you is, can't take yes. a new job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. Uh, yeah. uh, no, but it it is true, and that's one of the things that I found that while I developed this for business, solving business problems and societal problems, I mean, it is very applicable to personal problems. Like we have problems everywhere, uh, not just at work. And even just going in and thinking differently about your relationship or your children or whatever, you can also do, see reframing in action there. Sure, sure, sure. Now, um, looking in the mirror, this is not the uh, elevator mirror, which we talk about. It is a more unpleasant mirror, if you will. And, and think about uh, your own behavior in a situation. Because the truth is, very often, we, when we have a problem, we tend to think, well, I am the innocent victim and the problem is caused by these people over here. They are idiots and they are causing chaos in my life. The truth is that very often your own behavior is playing some role in creating the problem. We are part, we are contributing to the problem. And so you have to go in and ask, if my team is not doing what I want them to do, what should I do differently as a leader? What am I, how am I creating this problem? Like a very simple example from, from home, we spoke about 
uh, that before is if your children spend too much time looking at their phones, like they're sitting with their phones and their iPads and so on, and you go, hey, you should really uh, spend less time on your phone. Now, where do you think they have learned that from? Like very often, like sometimes I've, I've seen parents go in and tell their kids, hey, you should spend less time on the phone while holding the phone in their hand. <laughs> like, yeah. like literally, we, we, part of the problem is, of course, that kids look to their parents as role models mm -hmm. on good and bad behaviors. So right. basic question, look in the mirror, ask what is my part in creating the problem? Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. The and final the, one. Yeah, yeah. taking yeah. their perspective. Exactly. One of the most interesting findings from the research into what's called perspective taking or basically empathy mm. is that we are capable as human beings of understanding what is happening with somebody else. Like we, we're capable of thinking about if I have a problem with my sister, well, you know, maybe I can try to imagine what my sister is worried about. Mm. But here's the surprising finding. You have to ask the question. Like it, we have the ability, but we don't tend to use it unless somebody says, you or somebody else says, what problem do you think your sister is trying to solve? What do you think is going on on her side? How do you think she sees this situation? If you don't ask the problem, most of the time, we just forget. We just assume my sister's an idiot. She's really annoying. Where in reality, if we go in and ask the question, try to genuinely understand the other person and move beyond that first tendency to think, ah, they are just you know, bad people, then you have a much, much better chance of really understanding what is going on in the situation. Right. That's wonderful. In fact, you know, it fits in with uh, a lot of research on perspective taking in negotiations. Beautiful. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are, uh, you know, you mentioned the term empathy. You know, there are two types of empathy uh, in, 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 in the, in, in that researchers have, have identified. One is called emotional empathy, you know, where you identify with the situation with that the other person is that the other person is in and you experience the same kinds of emotions as the other mm. person is experiencing. The second type of uh, empathy is referred to as cognitive empathy, where you're just looking at the problem from the other person's perspective. And I think when you talk about perspective taking, uh, you're referring to more the second type of empathy. Exactly. Uh, which may actually, in some cases, especially if it's somebody as close to you as your sister, which may lead you into a more emotional kind of an empathy yeah. uh, uh, situation, a more emotional empathetic response. But you begin by, you know, looking at the cognitive uh, side of what they are, what they are experiencing. The, right? the simple way of remembering this uh, yes. is, is the difference. Imagine that your neighbor is building a fence and he hits his finger uh, with the hammer. Mm -hmm. Now, empathy, the, the, the emotional side is to feel his pain, like, ouch, that must have hurt. Mm -hmm. Cognitive empathy is to understand why he's building the fence. Mm -hmm. Like, why is, does he feel it is necessary to put up a fence mm -hmm. uh, at the moment? So that's a very powerful distinction. And I yes. think as you're referring to, people tend to only focus on the emotions and forget asking, hey, what information do they have? What, what are their beliefs? What, what's they, what do they not know about this? And you're right, that's exactly from uh, the research into negotiations. That's one of the areas where it has really come out. I know this because I took your class in negotiations. Yes, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, great, great, wonderful, wonderful. So, um, uh, very nice uh, five-step, uh, uh, you know, uh, process. But in your book and in your article, you make it very clear that this whole process of reframing can get quite messy. And uh, in, in other words, it's not a very linear and clean process. And you are very upfront in alerting managers to the messiness of the whole process. And um, and in, in fact, you know, um, 
informing them that they should, in some sense, be prepared for a messy yes. process, right? So could you talk yes. a little more about that? It's because I have sometimes found that people who are want to get good at problem solving, they sometimes take this, I, I might call it an engineering mindset, where they really think, oh, no, 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 we, we are just going to like have very rigidly defined processes uh, and all of this. And that often means that they are averse to uncertainty. They don't like feeling uncertainty because it's very comforting to have like, oh, step one, step two, step three. Mm -hmm. One of the key findings in this area uh, is really that people who are good at problem solving, they are more comfortable with uncertainty. They, they have taught themselves to be okay with the fact that there's not one clear problem right now. We actually need to get a little bit messy before we can make progress. Mm -hmm. One of the key scholars in this area is uh, Roger Martin, formerly Dean of the Rotman School in Canada, who has studied this and found it to be true. We, we, we need to learn to be systematic, uh, to be detail-oriented, but we also need to learn the habit of being okay with things being a bit messy for a while, like mm -hmm. not trying to jump too quickly to solutions and uh, let's move forward. Careful with that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, the other thing that just struck me about, uh, you know, when you when you talk about this, this process is that you explicitly discourage the use of checklists. Um, and, and I was intrigued. So, so could you, Explain to us why. I see checklists ultimately as training wheels, especially mm -hmm. for this process. To be clear, checklists are good in some contexts. Like if you look at the medical world, for instance, checklists has made a tremendous difference to make sure that, you know, the surgeon doesn't forget something during the operation or, or whatever it is. But when it comes to reframing, the key thing is really to think critically and so I sometimes have found that when you put a framework in front of people, there are some people who will go in and say, okay, step one, two, three, four, five, now I'm done. And it's like, no, you actually, it's not about going through the process. It is about asking questions and about asking, should there be a sixth strategy here for this problem? The, so constantly challenging your own way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I'd add to that, if it's a checklist, it becomes a process and then you don't use it as much. Mm. What I see reframing is, is really as a habit of mind. It is, it is a, almost just a perspective you have in the back of your head. Whenever you run into a problem, you're standing in the hallway, a colleague complains about something, then you instinctively just say, wait, what is the problem you're trying to solve and move your way forward in it. So thinking mm. of this, you can use it as a process, sure, but it is much more helpful to think of it as a almost a daily habit or a habit you just activate whenever you run into problems. Wonderful, 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 uh, Thomas. Yeah. Um, have have you like? I'm I'm curious if uh, if you have seen examples of this. I mean, yeah. in, in your work, I have actually. So so I have I have seen uh, some examples, and I, especially after reading your book and your article, uh, I'm more sensitive to, um, to this whole notion of reframing. So I, I see people doing it all the time, right? And we had discussed this in preparation for this session. So I've, I've prepared some slides to, 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 to share with the audience here. Um, there was a very, um, you know, important, uh, um, way in which reframing helped an entire city. And if you'll allow me to share my, my screen, I'd be happy to, to, to provide the details. And maybe during the, uh, during the Q and A, uh, some participants can also jump in and offer their thoughts. Uh, so um, Thomas had actually uh, asked me when we were preparing for the session to, to, to uh, um, you know, uh, uh, share, share, uh, one or two examples of my own. And I, I thought I would uh, share uh, what has become known as the Mumbai model of COVID management. Uh, this has been covered very widely in the Indian and international media. 
Uh, there have been a number of interviews that were conducted uh, uh, that are available on YouTube. So many of you may be familiar with this, uh, but you may not be uh, very familiar with uh, the way in which reframing helped uh, the city of Mumbai uh, manage uh, COVID better. So let me just um, uh, uh, give you some, some data points. So as you all know, um, I think both those of you who are living in India and those who are outside, that, that during the second COVID wave, which lasted uh, for three months or four months between February and June, thousands of patients in the large Indian cities were rushing to hospitals after testing positive and were not finding hospital beds or beds with oxygen support. And the problem was most severe in the capital city of Delhi. Now, I just want to say at this stage that there is no city in the world, you know, even in the most advanced and richest countries in the world, that can suddenly cater to a large section of the population showing up uh, ill and needing hospitalization. So the hospital infrastructure is actually designed to cater to a small minority of people in that city, in that location, uh, falling ill, okay? So this problem uh, in, in this sense was not, not necessarily a problem that was uh, uh, limited to developing countries like India. We saw this also in Italy, you know, where the hosp hospital system was overwhelmed. We saw this in New York. Uh, in 2020, where again, you know, we had you had patients being treated in the corridors of hospitals and so on and so forth, right? So, but at the same time, uh, we also had evidence about something that was very interesting, right? And that was that, and here this this quote from an article in the media, it says, healthcare professionals have expressed serious concern over the blocking of beds by those COVID-19 patients who do not require hospitalization, including those who are asymptomatic or are suffering from a mild case of infection. Experts claim that such patients can undergo isolation at home and do not need to be monitored by doctors. And sources in hospitals such as Max, Medanta, Fortis, Apollo, and many other facilities in Delhi, NCR, National Capital Region, have said that a substantial number of beds are occupied by such patients. So this was common knowledge, okay? This was being stated by leading doctors such as Dr. Guleria, who is the, uh, uh, the director of the All India Institute of, uh, Medical, uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences in, in New Delhi, perhaps one of the most prestigious hospitals in India, and other doctors such as Dr. Naresh Trehan. Uh, over 200 beds were vacated across hospitals in the, in the district in Noida on Friday after they were found to be occupied by patients who did not need them as per their health condition following, following an inspection by the health department, the official said, right? So this was a quote from the Hindustan Times. So what was the Mumbai model? So the Mumbai model basically consisted of, you know, it was introduced by the commissioner, the gentleman by name Iqbal Chahal, uh, who took charge of uh, of the uh, of his new job in May of 2020? And one of the first things he did was that he persuaded uh, both the government hospitals and it, the private hospitals to hand over the bed allocation decisions to the municipal commission. So rather than patients going straight to hospitals and getting admitted, these patients could only be admitted if they went through the Mumbai municipality. So he, and the other thing he did was, what was happening? I mean, he was very, very interesting. He found that labs where the diagnostic tests were being conducted, the RT-PCR tests were being conducted. Of course, they were sharing the results of the tests with the individuals who were tested. You know, they were, the results were either COVID positive or COVID negative. Those who were uh, informed that they were COVID positive, in many cases were panicking, which is understandable, were panicking and rushing to hospitals and occupying beds because they were worried that if their situation became worse, 
their medical condition became worse, that there would be a shortage of beds. Okay, so one of the first things that uh, uh, that Mr. Chahal did was that he ordered all the labs in Mumbai not to share the results of the test directly with the patients first, but to share them with the municipality first. Now, this was a very controversial order, and it was challenged in the Supreme Court of India on the grounds that it violated the patient rights and it would lead to a delay in patients getting treatment. But um, Mr. Chahal was able to reassure the Supreme Court that a particular day's re test results would be shared with the patients latest by 8 a.m. the next day, okay? And the reason he didn't want the, the results to be shared with the pa patients directly was that he wanted the bed allocation process to be handled by the municipal commission. And therefore, based on the test results, and based on phone calls that the control rooms made to the patients directly after receiving the tests, they were able to ascertain which of these individuals had no symptoms. In other words, they were asymptomatic and which of them had mild, moderate or severe symptoms. And only those with moderate to severe symptoms were taken to hospitals. And so this whole process actually required mobilization of resources. So they had hundreds of ambulances ready to show up at the, uh, you know, the, the individual's uh, homes and take them directly to the hospitals. But only those patients, only those individuals who had moderate to severe symptoms were taken to hospital. And those who did not have symptoms or had mild symptoms were asked to um, uh, isolate themselves at home with daily follow-up from the medical team at the municipal commission. So, so as a result of this, you know, even at the peak of the second wave, which was in early April in Mumbai, uh, when they reported daily new cases of 11,200, and when active cases in the city crossed 90,000, there was no shortage of either hospital beds or oxygen in Mumbai. And so this has become very famously known as the Mumbai model. Now, why is this relevant to reframing? Okay. So fundamentally, Mr. Chahal and his team reframed the problem. The original problem that was given to them was there are not enough hospital beds and beds with oxygen support. And this was the problem that cities like Delhi and Ahmedabad and other cities, these, this was the problem that the other cities were trying to solve. And therefore, they took this problem that there were not enough hospital beds or beds with oxygen support. And then their solution was, how can we get more hospital beds and more oxygen? Whereas Iqbal Chahal's team redefined the problem and they said, a significant percentage of hospital beds is occupied by people who do not need hospitalization or oxygen. Now, with this definition of the problem, their solution then was, how can we better allocate the hospital beds and beds with oxygen support? So you see, a reframing of the problem led to uh, a, a tremendous you know, um, impact in terms of a city's ability, a city you know, with, with 20 million people, or you know, the, the municipal commission probably uh, you know, is, is, is um, responsible for uh, 16 to 17 million people, uh, it, it led to this city being able to manage a public health crisis much more effectively, right? Uh, so I thought I would share this uh, because uh, Thomas, you had asked me to share some I, examples from India. And, and uh, I know that, uh, yeah, you like this very much, right? Yeah. I think it is such a powerful example of it. It shows two things really, that if you, don't get the problem right, it can have tremendous consequences. Like that, that early on in the process, if, if you just like accept the problem as, as, as it is put to you, then you are left to scramble for, oh, how do we get more oxygen, which every city was trying to do. Mm. And it shows the difference it can make when one person, or maybe it was a team who arrived at this. Yeah can go in and say, wait a second, before we just charge ahead, 
do we really understand the problem? Is there a different way of thinking about it? About that change by, uh, by, I think his name was Iqbal Chahal, that change, like think of how many lives that has saved. Same, because exactly. one person went in and said, wait, we are not thinking about the problem in the right way. The problem is occupancy. And let's make sure we, we get the admissions process right so we don't end up with this other problem, which is much, much harder to solve for us. Yes. Such a powerful example. Yes. So let's see if there are questions that the audience would like to ask. Please write your questions um, in the uh, chat box. Um, yeah. I I can see some has come in already here. Uh, you can either write in the chat or in the Q&A as some of you have done. Uh, and uh, I love, there, there, uh, yeah. There is, there is one question that is, uh, you know, unrelated to reframing. So they, <laughs> they, they've asked you, um, hello, Thomas, how do you succeed in life? So, 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 so while I look at the other questions, do you want to quickly take that? <laughs> uh, uh, I, am, uh, I can only say what has worked for me. Uh, one thing is education, like education and reading has made such a big difference to my life. And also trying to go beyond just reading, but applying things like one of the things, Rama, I remember from your class in uh, both negotiations, but entrepreneurship was you had us practice things all the time. Yes. yes. So it wasn't just about learning the theory of negotiation. No, in the very first class, we sat down and we had to negotiate something. Yes. And then you took us through like, well, here's what happened in the negotiation. Here's why some of you did really well. Others did horribly. Like, so that practice of thinking of like educating yourself but thinking of education as a practical thing, yes. uh, not just theory you stuff into your brain. Yes. Uh, I, I'd say that that has made a big difference, big difference. for me. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Uh, somebody says a problem well-defined is half solved. Okay. So that's, that's not. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, that's uh, Mr. Ramesh, it looks like. Uh, yes. That's actually really interesting because this is a quote from 1938. Right. The first person who, who said this, a problem well-defined is half solved, was a gentleman called uh, John Dewey, mm -hmm. who was a big figure in, uh, in, around that time. And I mentioned this to say that we have known about reframing for a long time. Mm -hmm. Like it, it is something we need to get better at. We have the theory. We know it is important. We have seen it in every field that it is critical. Uh, it's time to get better at actually doing it. So mm -hmm. beautiful uh, quote. Thank you for sharing that. Right, right. And there's another comment here that says in Africa, incubators were difficult to make and maintain. So they, here they're talking about not entrepreneurship incubators, but real incubators in hospitals for, uh, for babies that, are, that need incubation. Uh, and uh, whose lives are, are in danger, right? The makers made an incub incubators from cars and car materials as they saw people using cars regardless. It proved useful and saved a lot of lives, right? Yes. I, yeah, I love that story. Uh, yes. It is, uh, I think it's actually an example of also what's sometimes called, I think it's Jugat innovation. Yes. Like that yes. practice of learning from countries that are more scrappy. That, that take a simpler approach and say, well, we could solve this with very high technology, but that's difficult to get, difficult to maintain. Or we can think about how we use a used car to save the lives of babies. And that is a, in many places, of course, much more sustainable. So right. a really powerful example, I think, of right. how innovation is not always about technology. It is equally about thinking differently about yes. what you're trying to do and being scrappy, if you will. Sure, sure, sure. Vidhu Sharma has a question. He says, Thomas, you said that only that the only danger of uh, reframing is that you may get stuck in, in thinking and, and fail to act, I think, is, is what he means, right? And how do you deal with that? Uh, it's really about seeing it as a cycle. Like, so you remember uh, this thing here I shared earlier with frame, analyze, solve. That is deliberately not step one, two, three. Rather, it is something you do repeatedly. So the real figure, I would say, is to go in and think of it as a cycle. 
So you start by framing and analyzing. You Then you go out and do an experiment. And then maybe later that week, you go in and said, after we have done experiments and talked to people, what have we learned about the problem? Are we still seeing the problem in the right way? I have found that the key to this is the ability to do this part quickly. Some people think you have to go two weeks into the mountains, think deep thoughts, and then arrive at a framing. What I teach people is that with practice, if you start applying this in your life, you can actually do this part in maybe 10 minutes. And it's not going to be finished, but you'll have started and you'll have opened some more doors into, wait, is it just the speed of the elevator? Or could it be the weight? Or could it be the timing? And then you go into the real world and learn more about the problem. So that, I would say, is the key. Remembering the third step of moving into action and uh, getting better at applying this quickly. Don't think your analysis has to be perfect from the start. Get moving instead. Uh, Pablo Dominguez, my, my good friend from Peru, uh, he asks, uh, symptoms are an input to reframing uh, and are they indispensable in, in reframing the, the, the problem? I have sometimes uh, resisted the idea of symptoms a little bit. Mm -hmm. And why, why do I say that? Symptoms is a really helpful tool within medicine. Mm -hmm. where you know there's a symptom and then there's, oh, it's this, you know, it's COVID or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. With real problems, though, it's actually not always clear whether things are symptoms or not. Mm -hmm. Like in the elevator example, you could say that they're annoying, that the tenants are annoyed. That's just a symptom of the speed of the elevator. But in reality, you can also treat the fact that they're annoyed as the key problem. Mm -hmm. so, so I would suggest to you that whatever information you have about the problem look at it all as data points don't be too quick to say oh that's just a symptom because sometimes you can actually fix the symptom and it can work like it, it it's it's uh, it's a little dangerous just to say that's a symptom we don't have to l look at it what is the real problem like the whole point of this method is there isn't always one real problem there's actually typically many different ways of solving a problem Okay, Nagaraj Kumar has a, a question. Why do we name them as problems? They are merely situations which need proper ways to handle or, or to face. Really good point. I, I have seen, I think, two different approaches to this. What I like sometimes are people who say, don't call it a problem, call it an opportunity. I call it a situation we have to deal with. Uh, this is a chance for us to improve. It is a positive thing. What I love about that is that it, it takes a positive look at it. As we spoke about before, it can really help having a, a more positive mindset when it comes to problem solving, including the belief that you can solve the problem. The only thing I'd say is you can sometimes take that too far. I have seen organizations where the senior leadership was so insistent on like, oh, no, we don't have any problems here. It's all just improvement opportunities that the employees got a little bit, come on, no, we have real problems here. I, I normally make the joke with, uh, you remember that movie Apollo 13, uh, where they have an emergency in space. I mean, they, they said, Houston, we have a problem. They didn't say, Houston, we have an improvement opportunity. Our oxygen is going away. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, uh, but it's a really good point, like yeah. keeping the positive mindset and don't get stuck to labels too much. Uh, yes. You can change them too. Okay. Anirudh Gupta uh, has a question. Is this pro problem solving process linked to conventional PDCA and HD approach where the first step talks about problem statement? It is. Those are both, for those of you who don't know, those are both really powerful uh, problem solving methodologies. Uh, they are really in depth. The only thing I have observed is that even people who are trained in these things can sometimes fail in that first step. Like I, I have taught this to people who are, who are trained in many different forms of root cause analysis. And somehow, I think in part because like they tend to overlook it. I think it's because many of these problems that we have created the methodologies around are from a manufacturing environment. 
And in a manufacturing environment, the problem typically isn't that fuzzy. Like, you know, if you're making cars and the cars stop working, you know exactly what your goal is. Mm -hmm. And you know there's probably one thing that went wrong somewhere. When you're dealing with other problems, leadership problems, uh, political problems, COVID, then it's not as clear cut. Then there's actually a need to do this. And I think it's not all, all of the methodologies I've seen. It, they, many of them are too limited in kind of this particular thing of reframing the problem. They are fully on board that you have to analyze it and they're great at that. They're not always as strong as saying, wait, is this framed correctly in the first place? I mean, does the client even understand their own problem uh, before we do what they ask us to do, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, here's another question from Sanjay Kumar. Uh, he says, I would like to know if your lift example pertains to reframing with respect to attribute framing of the problem or goal framing of the problem. I would say it can be both. Uh, so you're referring to some of the work that uh, exists in this area too. Uh, he's, and, uh, he's specifically referring to Lewin, 1998. Yes. There is, um, what fascinated me with this is, there's so much research on this, you wouldn't believe it. One thing is what we spoke about earlier with the Hungarian psychologist, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, who uh, back in the 60s did the original studies uh, empirically of this. But actually, if you look at almost any discipline in which people think seriously about problem solving, you will find th uh, theory people, you will find frameworks and so on. I would encourage you to explore what's there in your industry. I have created what you could call a general framework for it that you can use anywhere. There may be frameworks out there that can help more specifically with types of problems that are powerful in your industry. And that's, that's one of the examples, for instance, uh, that distinction between attributes and goals, like what are the features and wait, what are we really trying to achieve? So look broadly, start with this as a simple way, but there's a lot of depth to it if you want to really master problem solving. Here is a question from Manish. First, Manish says, wonderful session, Ram and Thomas. Thanks for sharing useful insights. Does reframing help in incremental innovations or also in breakthrough path-breaking innovations? Uh, I believe it is applicable everywhere. And weirdly enough, I believe it is underapplied with incremental innovations. We tend to focus so much on that industry game-changing thing because it ended up on the cover of India Times or, or whatever. But in reality, 98% of our problems are smaller than that. They, 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 they are daily problems we're facing. There's something going on with the client. What I dream of is imagine if we could get better, not just at, at the big breakthrough stories, but also just at freeing up all that energy we right now are wasting on the wrong problems. Imagine if we got 10% better at solving the right problem to start with, that 10% more cities had a breakthrough like the case you described. Like what would that have saved? How, how much of a difference could it make if, if we got better at seeing this, not just for breakthrough innovation, but also for everyday problems that we face? Actually, um, you know, there's a very nice article in Harvard Business Review about this. Uh, it, it's, it's, I don't remember exactly the title, but it goes something like uh, the, um, the importance of incremental innovations, I think, or the importance of routine innovations. And the author gives some really good examples. So uh, Windows was a breakthrough, right? Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows. But after it was introduced, Microsoft has captured value from that breakthrough innovation through a series of incremental innovations, right? Over 30, 35 years. Uh, same is true of Intel's chip, right? So the breakthrough innovation came, I think it was that... Um, uh, very famous 1985 was when that chip was introduced. And since then, Intel has introduced a series of incremental innovations. Same with iPhone in 2007, right? iPhone was a breakthrough innovation. It completely redefined what a smartphone is. Yeah. And, it, and, and it led to Nokia's market share going from 52 and a half 
to to nothing, right? Um, but how has uh, you know Apple captured value from that breakthrough innovation through a series of incremental innovations? So I think what what Thomas is saying is really important, right? So incremental innovation is is very important, and and a company should have incremental innovation projects in its portfolio. But I think more importantly, you know, the idea is that breakthrough innovations and incremental innovations go hand in hand. Uh, I don't think uh, you know you can separate those two in that way, right? Um, let's look at more questions. Uh, uh, one second. Uh, 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 there is one here. When will be the when will be the Indian edition of Thomas's book available? I mean, it's available on it's available on on Amazon. So let me just uh, put up the reference here. I'll share oh, my. Screen. Yeah. I, I, you can buy it, you know, you can buy the Kindle edition yeah. anytime. Uh, I don't know whether what you get in India is the, uh, is the uh, Indian edition or the international edition. So the price may be a little high, but uh, these are the, uh, the, the references for you uh, that, uh, and one good thing about um, Thomas is that uh, the, re the reason I like his work is that it's very firmly anchored in research. And so you'll find both in his book and in his HPR article, you'll find a number of uh, more in his book, I think, than in HPR, because the HPR people don't like too many footnotes. <laughs> but in his, the, in his book, you'll find lots and lots of references. So if there's any particular theme that you want to pursue in greater depth, you know where to where to go for the source. Yeah. Okay. There is uh, there is in the book, uh, a list literally of recommended readings where I go in not just the sources, but also specific books you can delve deeper into uh, if, if you want to look look more into it. And I uh, to be clear, if you just want the sources without the book, they are available on my website as well. So howtoreframe.com, you can see the a little bit of the theory behind it if you want to delve deeper in what we spoke about. Uh, right. I'll, I'll put it into the chat right now. Uh, I the, think the uh, URL. Yeah, so I have I have put the the three references that I had on the screen. I have put them up in chat so that you can just you can just copy those. Okay. Um, let me see more questions. Uh, when will be the okay? Uh, so one one question again, uh, not to do with reframing. What is your motto, which help you through ups and downs in your life? Right. So it's a, a very general question. Go ahead. I would say something my father told me at one point, uh, namely the words, uh, sometimes the greatest joy is, is that of giving. Like, and when I've, you know, if I've gone through hard times, sometimes we, like, I tend to focus on myself and my problems. And I found it actually gives me energy and helps me if I step away from myself and try to help somebody else. Uh, so, that's a very simple motto I found to be very true. And, and there's, a, there's a strange joy in that. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, so here is a question. Um, Tejas with Chaudhary is asking this question. Uh, what do we do when, you, when we do not have the luxury of time to analyze a problem and we need to respond immediately, yeah. right? Yeah. Two different steps. Uh, one we already mentioned, namely getting into the habit of doing this in only five minutes, because it's true, we don't sometimes have days to think differently about it. But it is very rare outside of almost like combat situations that you don't have at least five minutes where you can go in and ask a question or two about the problem. That's the first one. The second one I'd say is to recognize that you can do this in stages. So imagine that a client is very demanding and say, no, stop talking about the problem. Like, let's move forward. What you can do then is to go out and try to gather data to help you reframe it. Here's an example. Uh, one of the people I write about in the book is a designer called Chris Dame, who was called in by a client company to make their IT system easier to use. Like they had this platform with knowledge sharing where employees were supposed to put knowledge up and nobody used it. And they all said, oh, it's way too hard to use. Now, Chris had a sense that there was something wrong and the client didn't want to listen. 
So what he did was he went out and set up some anonymous interviews with the employees where the management was not in the room. And then he came back to the leadership and presented their, the findings and said, you know what? You may have heard that it is too complex to use, but in reality, here's what people say, that they're afraid of losing their job if they share their knowledge. Because the way you promote people has nothing to do with who helps others and everything to do with whether you got onto the right project to start with. And once the leadership got that, they changed their system uh, of the, their way of evaluating who should be promoted. So people became more collaborative. But that's a beautiful example of somebody saying, okay, we don't have time right now, but let's go out as we work on the solution and actually gather data that can maybe also help us check if we're solving the right problem. And at the end of the day, uh, I love this quote from a friend of mine, um, you can get into this situation where we don't have time to invent the wheel because we're so busy carrying heavy things. Like th 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 there is a discipline as a leader of creating the time or small islands of time to make sure you don't solve the right problem because I can guarantee you, you're gonna waste more time on this if you solve the wrong problem to start with. So there's one question which says, uh, can this method be applied to solve uh, wicked problems? So, uh, uh, so wicked problems, uh, as I understand it, and maybe you want to comment on that too, Thomas, before you start answering it. Uh, I've understood wicked problems to be uh, problems that have uh, a significant, significant impact on, on society and on, on people, but they are very complex to solve. Right, uh, yeah. poverty, for example, would be a wicked problem. Um, so, so can this be applied uh, to solve those wicked and complex problems? Very much so. Uh, wicked problems, uh, as it was originally defined, is a problem that's kind of shifting. That is where the goals are not clear, and may there may be multiple contrasting goals. And if effectively, it is nothing like the elevator; it is a complete mess. I would argue that especially in those situations, reframing is critical because if you fall in, like what I sometimes see is that people define a problem and then they freeze. Like then they just think, oh, the problem will not change. Nokia might be a good example, right? They, they had solved the problem of phones really, really well. And then Apple came along and the environment changed but they still stuck to their standard way of thinking about the problem. It is about building better hardware instead of the realization uh, that, oh, it has actually now become about the apps, about the, the, the software and the ecosystem and so on. I would argue uh, that if we are to solve the many wicked problems from climate change to whatever you can pick, political tension, I think reframing is a key part of that. Uh, they are wicked, they are difficult, but we can also make progress on them. And I think we have seen that through history that wicked does not mean unsolvable. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so I think with that, uh, uh, Thomas, I'm also mindful of the fact that uh, it is Friday evening and uh, many people probably have dinners and movies that they've arranged. Movies, I think is more difficult now with, with you know, although the cases have come down quite a lot in India, I don't think movie theaters are open yet in many cities, but uh, restaurants are open and I'm sure lots of people have plans to, to go out and, and enjoy themselves. Um, it's been a wonderful session uh, and um, I want to uh, thank the audience for their interest. Uh, two messages to the audience. Uh, we will uh, look for opportunities once uh, travel normalizes to have uh, Thomas visit us in India and, and come to our campus in Hyderabad. Um, and the second, you know, uh, uh, the Mahindra University School of Management is a new school of management. We are offering three bachelor's programs this year, a BA in economics and finance, a BBA in computational business analytics, and a BBA in digital technologies. So if you know anyone who is, uh, who's currently finished, has finished high school, and is looking to uh, uh, looking for opportunities uh, to study 
um, in, in, in a good university, uh, please uh, ask them to look at Mahindra University School of Management and we'll be happy to provide them with more information. Okay, uh, thanks uh, Thomas and I'll we'll catch up either in New York or in Hyderabad. Do you want to say any, any final words before we, we close the session? Uh, only to encourage you to start practicing this. It can yes. make a tremendous difference. It is not that hard to learn. Uh, and I, I think it's high time that we get better at this. We have known about reframing for way too long. And I hope that in 10 years time, it's not going to be 85% of companies that say we're bad at it. It's going to be a significantly lower number because people like you start to just master this and solve the right problems. So thank you for listening. And Rama, thanks so much for inviting me. It was a, it was a pleasure. Please join me in, in, in thanking Thomas for a wonderful session. Uh, and, and we look forward to engaging with you again. This was just the first of, uh, of, this, uh, of the series, uh, Cutting at Charcha. And uh, we are looking forward to bringing you uh, insights from similarly, uh, you know, well-qualified and expert speakers in the, in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thomas. I'll catch up with you later. Yeah. Thank you.